Hey class, welcome to Melanie Martinez Ology 101, the YouTube channel that wasn't supposed to be about Melanie Martinez, but I'm autistic and here we are again. Today I will be analyzing and defending the song Mad Hatter from her first album, Cry Baby. Some of you may be wondering what? Defending? Well, the short version is people are, in my opinion, taking the wording too literally when Melanie's songwriting has always been highly metaphorical. And they're not taking the context of the song into account and are not taking the person who wrote the song and what she's been through in it to account. There's this misconception of the song Mad Hatter that it's about how being crazy makes you superior to others and thus people argue that it glamorizes mental illness. And I can see where people get this argument, but it is, in my opinion, a really surface-level interpretation of the lyrics. And the more I analyzed the song, the more I saw this Alice in Wonderland-themed message about being comfortable in your own skin, despite the fact that having a mental illness means people see you as crazy. And the less I saw it as some edgy song about how trendy it is to have anxiety. So without further ado, I bring you... My Interpretation of Mad Hatter by Melanie Martinez The first thing I need to point out is that the song is Alice in Wonderland themed. Melanie isn't the first artist to do something like this, far from it. And the references are also extremely obvious to anyone who has read the book or actually even watched the Disney adaptation. So obvious, in fact, that I think a lot of the critics of the song's message are ignoring this on purpose. I really do. You know, the lines over the bend, entirely bonkers, and so what if I'm crazy, all the best people are. Those are both direct quotes, I think from Alice herself. Uh, I know they're from the book. Reworded a little to fit the rhythm of the song. So the full quote is, you're entirely bonkers, but I'll tell you a secret. All the best people are. Other lines from that song that are clearly taken from the book include the oft-used phrases over the bend, from around the bend, mad and bonkers. So, so why is it okay for Lewis Carroll to say something in a children's book, but when Melanie adapts it for a song with a YA audience, all of a sudden she's glamorizing mental illness? So either this has been a problem since 1865 when Alice's Adventures in Wonderland was written, or it was never a problem and people are just trying to stir shit up. The second thing I need to point out is that Melanie's albums, Crybaby and K-12, through follow a character named Crybaby. Mad Hatter follows the songs Tag or It and Milk and Cookies, a double feature which shows Crybaby being kidnapped by the Big Bad Wolf. She escapes by poisoning the Big Bad Wolf's milk and cookies. Afterward, Crybaby is left permanently scarred by these events, presumably by what's happened to her and all she's had to do. In the album's booklet, the entry for Pacify Her reads, She escaped and was never the same. She swayed a boy who had been claimed. And pacified old what's-her-name, not out of love, just played a game. And of course, the old crybaby from Carousel and Training Wheels would not have done that. Training Wheels crybaby gave up on him when he didn't attend her birthday party in Pity Party in the song prior to Tag Your It. When we get to the entry for Mad Hatter, crybaby sat and disagreed, imperfect, insane, and emotional was she, but she feels safe going to sleep, and there's no one she'd rather be. But if you look at what's going on, Crybaby isn't actually insane. She's just finally standing up for herself. Maybe stealing someone's boyfriend and poisoning a man might sound crazy and reckless out of context. But when you know everything Crybaby has been through, suddenly it makes sense. So I would venture to say that Crybaby is not insane. She's simply different. It's other people calling her crazy. Crybaby is content with herself, and she's finally accepted who she is. Crybaby ignored the words of society in the previous song, Mrs. Potato Head, protesting the idea that pain meant beauty. So when you put the Mrs. Potato Head and Mad Hatter entries together, you get Crybaby rejecting society's idea on who she should be both inside and out. So, let's take a break to talk about something great, like this video's sponsor, Skillshare. I can tell you from experience, being self-taught is very overrated. So instead, I recommend being self-motivated and joining Skillshare, an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes on topics like drawing, photography, creative writing, and music, as well as more niche things surrounding productivity, lifestyle, and freelance marketing skills. Skillshare is curated for learning, and there are no ads like here on YouTube, just a burgeoning 
pool of awesome classes taught by experts. And unlike art school, it won't put you into debt forever, as it is less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. It is truly the best place to develop your current skills or even pick up a new passion. Something you've always wanted to try, you know? Professional graphic novelist Ira Marks teaches a great class, Illustration by Design, a guide to elevating your drawing skills. He teaches you how to apply design skills to illustration to create illustrations that are creative and engaging. It is a must for those who are interested in conveying visual storytelling with their art. He goes over pretty much everything, how to plan a composition, create line art, how to use negative space, etc, etc. And there are tons more great classes like these on Skillshare. The first 1000s of my subscribers to click the link on the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. I hope you enjoy your Skillshare subscription as much as I enjoy mine. The third thing I'd like to point out is the perspective of the singer-songwriter. Melanie has always been perceived as different from others, even back when she was on The Voice. Now, I don't know of any clinical diagnosis for her, though I've long been curious about it, considering she has to toke to tolerate performing in front of people, but, you know, but that, that's beside the point. I'm not here to armchair diagnose. My point is, though it's commonly believed she's free from psychiatric disorders because Timothy Heller, I love saying that name, called her neurotypical, misusing the word, and then made fun of her for writing edgy songs about crazy people, blah, blah, blah. Listen, even if we play Timothy's advocate and pretend that she's a reliable source of information, it's not relevant to the song. What matters is Melanie doesn't fit in. She never has. She's made that quite clear. You know, she was bullied growing up. And from someone who's been there, see my last story time for details. I know that fucks with your self-esteem in a way that you'd have to go through it to understand. I mean, people think that bullying is some kind of a rite of passage or it toughens you up or it's just not that big of a deal. And that, none of that's true. On the contrary, a lot of people actually develop complex PTSD, depression, anxiety, and or substance abuse issues from being bullied over a significant period of time. So we need to stop taking Timothy word for it that Melanie doesn't have any issues from this seeing as how she's written songs for it and it's appeared in her work because like you know bottom line of course it's none of our business if she has a mental illness because she has not shared that with us whether she does or doesn't you know what I mean we're not entitled to her medical information so we can determine if she has the moral right to sing the song she wrote for a fictional character that's invasive nonsense. I vote that we should just stop even going along that thought train because we need to respect her privacy on that front instead of speculating on whether or not she's mentally ill enough to sing Mad Hatter based on the word of a proven liar whom she dropped from her social circle. It's not even relevant because one, the song is from the perspective of, again, a fictional character. And two, the song is not about being crazy as I'll get into more in a bit. It's about accepting yourself in a world that calls you crazy. Based on what we know she's been through, it's pretty obvious to me that she's not coming from the perspective of, ha, let's profit off my crazy ass fans so the normals can pretend they're insane and having a good time like crazy people do. She's coming from the perspective of someone who's been through some hard times herself, whether she has a illness or not, and has come out of that being more loving and empathetic toward people who are different. Many people see the line, so what if I'm crazy, all the best people are, and they interpret it to mean crazy people are superior, as if the world works in a way where crazy people are seen as glamorous and something you'd want to be. <laughs> well, that doesn't, it just doesn't work, because the world does not and has never worked that way. She's not saying, oh, thank God I'm crazy because all the best people are, so now I can be cool like Sybil Isabel Dorset. She's saying, so what? So what if the normals think I'm crazy? There's nothing wrong with being crazy. If I'm crazy, that's the way I am, and I can't change it, so why beat myself up over it? I have ride or die friends who understand me, they've been through what I've been through, so it doesn't matter what the normals call me because the other crazies understand me. The crazies make me feel sane. But Piper, you say. What about the line, tell the psychiatrist something is wrong? Now I see where you're coming from, but I personally interpret this as a bit of a tongue-in-cheek 
and that's because of the lines preceding it. So when you're analyzing any work of literature, including song lyrics, you have to look at the context. Because if you pull a line out of random, like out of context, it just doesn't work. You can't just pull out any line and say, boom, this is proof the song is entirely about being clinically insane and how that means you're edgy and cool. It just, it just doesn't work. You have to look at the whole chorus. <clears throat> I'm nuts, baby, I'm mad. The craziest friend that you've ever had. You think I'm psycho, you think I'm gone. Tell the psychiatrist something is wrong. Over the bend, entirely bonkers. You like me best when I'm off my rocker. Tell you a secret, I'm not alarmed. So what if I'm crazy? The best people are. All the best people are crazy. All the best people are. Congratulations to me, I didn't sing. Whew. Anyway. So what stands out to me here again is, well, the Alice in Wonderland themed words like nuts, mad, you know. But when it gets less Alice in Wonderland and it's phrasing and more aggressive, it's accompanied by words you think. Not, I am psycho, I am gone, tell the psychiatrist something is wrong. It's, you think I'm psycho, you think I'm gone, tell the psychiatrist something is wrong. So what I'm seeing here is people criticizing her, you know, labeling Crybaby as nuts, believing she needs to be medicated for the things that make her different, almost daring people to lock her away, as if the trauma that Crybaby survived makes her damaged and bad and needing to be either reformed or removed from society. But looking at the chorus as a whole instead of individual lines, it makes it clear to me at least that the song is about accepting yourself, even though or if you're crazy, not about how being crazy makes you superior in some way. It's about respecting yourself even when society refuses to because as I'll get more into in a bit, being mentally ill and or traumatized, it basically makes you a 21st century leper. Society expects you to be ashamed like it's your fault for the things that have happened to you or the things you were born with and let me tell you, the worst part about being assaulted, it was the shame. The fear that everyone would side with him and I just be the crazy person who wanted attention from an upstanding member of the National Guard. Anyway, I can't talk too long about this without but anyway, during the scene in the music video, you see her animal friends stab the normals before they can eat Crybaby, which saves her life because, you know, they deflate. <laughs> So, and what does that represent, you ask? Well, that brings us to the second oft-ignored meaning of the song. You see, Mad Hatter, it's not just about people calling you crazy and you being cool with it because so what, right? It's about her understanding friends and how they've helped her through and out of tough situations. So this song isn't, hey, Normie, you like me because I'm crazy, how fun. You, W, you. It's, they don't get it, they call us crazy, but we get it. You know, I'm, I'll be honest, I have never, not once in my life, met someone with a healthy brain who I felt like they really understood me, you know? Because I have PTSD, all my close friends have PTSD, some form of it, and you know why? It's not because we decided people with PTSD are literally the best. It's just because we gravitate toward people who understand us, you know? And I found that no one has more empathy for people with PTSD than people who have PTSD. No one understands it like we do because we've been through it, you know what I mean? You need to bear in mind, um, you know, crazy, it's not something people want to be, save for maybe the edgelord f***ers who are using other people's struggles to scare the carrot. Oh, actually, I guess that's not much of a thing anymore. It was back when I was a school, the uh, Marilyn Manson fans and all that. But anyway, back to the word crazy. It's generally de a derogatory word. When somebody in a vulnerable group uses a derogatory word as their identity, this is usually done to reclaim it, not to wallow in one's own pain. For example, LGBTQ plus Psi Alphabet Soup reclaimed the word queer, which is a lot easier and faster to say than LGBT plus QI something. And originally queer was, and sometimes still is, an insult. But there are a lot of benefits that came to the queer community by reclaiming the word queer, and while not every queer wants it, you know, it helps in general. I, I don't feel like getting into it. It's just an example, but you get the sort of thing I'm saying, right? This song does have the general tone of rebelling against those who think that crybaby should be ashamed to be crazy. Like, you can't call me crazy. I've just taken on the word crazy, and being crazy is great. You know, that sort of- I'm- I'm going off script here, sorry. I can't talk for shit, we all know that. <laughs> so now I'd like to take a break from the script to point out some hypocrisy that I noticed just recently. I haven't had time to fully explore this idea, 
But I'm gonna list a few songs here and something I noticed. Mad Hatter, Melanie Martinez. Teen Idol by Marina. Basically anything by Lana Del Rey or Billie Eilish, but let's go with Summertime Sadness and Listen Before I Go. So those songs have, in various circles, been criticized for something like glamoring, glamorizing mental illness, suicide, just being too edgy, etc, etc. Now I'm going to list a few more songs. Tourniquet by Amy Lee. I'm sorry, Evanescence, whatever. Death by Rock and Roll, Taylor Momsen, forgot what her band is called. The Pretty Reckless, excuse me. <laughs> Be My Friend, One-Eyed Doll. Girl Anachronism, Amanda Palmer, also forgot what her name is, her band is called. Dressed in Dolls, You'll Miss Me When I'm Not Around by Grimes. The second list of songs. These songs weren't really criticized for their themes, despite being very dark. And I, there's a very key difference between these two lists. All the songs that I mentioned that were accepted are rock or heavily alternative, whereas the former that were all criticized by the mainstream were all pop songs. The alternative side of pop, but still pop nonetheless. So why is it okay for rock stars and the like to sing about insanity, drugs, and other things that will get me demonetized, but when a pop star does it, it's suddenly a problem. You see, I think people have this preconception still that pop is bubblegum that lacks depth and that that's the way it's supposed to be. Pop songs are supposed to be about falling in love, partying, getting laid. Pop songs are supposed to be happy and meant for the lowest common denominator and they should never be risky. But when people hear a dark rock song, it's just another day, dime a dozen, been done since the birth of the genre. And if anyone criticizes a rock song for being too dark, it's, it's not just rock fans who are going to say, what'd you expect, Karen? But when a pop song is dark, wait, that's not how it's supposed to work. We can't let this darkness be accessible to the children. Maybe Karen has a point. Maybe this is problematic. You see, dark pop music, it's still relatively unexplored ter territory, excuse me. It really didn't start to get played on the radio until around, like, I guess 2010, to my memory. And pop isn't the only genre this happens to. I remember the teachers throwing a fit back when I was in elementary school because this girl wanted to sing Goodbye Earl at the talent show. If someone told you that listening to Nine Inch Nails was the gateway to heroin, you'd probably laugh. And rightfully so. So, you know, why should the lyrical content of pop be watered down and boring just because it has an accessible melody? And again, like, most of these songs aren't even actually glamorizing anything, you know, I truly believe that these trigger-happy accusations about glamorization suffocate artists from being able to openly and honestly vent their feelings. Some people feel like cutting, some people feel like killing themselves. And I know that's very unfortunate, but to say you're not allowed to sing about that sort of thing, that's just, it seems like a little much to me. I know I'm going in a bit of a different direction here. I'm just thinking about a lot of different artists and a lot of different songs now, but you get my point. Basically, just these trigger-happy accusations just keeping artists from being honest about how they feel. And I do, to a point, say this from experience as I was told similar things about my event art in the past over the years, but really, my conviction is because people don't tend to be coming from a genuine place when they accuse an artist of glamorizing something. The loudest voices always come from a place of spite and judgment, you know? A call to cancel every artist over every little thing until there's no one left to sing for us. You know, anyone who uses the tone of anger and self-righteousness, they're ratting themselves out from the get-go. They're very transparent. They do not care about mental health. Otherwise, the focus would be on mental health. Even if they have issues themselves, they're only using those issues to put down someone else. And, you know, that's not okay. Considering the tone of a lot of these complaints, I think the argument stems not from genuine concern about mental health, but from wanting a reason to hate Melanie Martinez because all the other reasons keep getting disproved by crazy YouTubers like me. <laughs> now, that's not to say every Melanie Martinez fan agrees with the song's message as they've interpreted it, or that all of them agree with the way I've interpreted it just now or whatever, just that most people... Most of the people who bring up this glamorization thing regularly are doing so in an attempt to be what I call evangelical haters. People who can't just be content disliking Melanie, but they have to make sure everyone else hates her too. Furthermore, the argument isn't based on a legitimate phenomenon, but perpetuates a false reality that suits their narrative best. And I realize I'm talking a, a little bit academic right now, sorry, but basically what I'm saying is the world doesn't work the way they say it does. And I have never heard anyone say it was cool that I'm mentally ill 
loyal or they want to be my friend because of it or some ah. shit like that, you know? I once told someone I was bipolar and he yeeted himself out of the area in under a minute in fear that I would falsely accuse him of R. You know, what's your word? People keep saying shit like, you can't be autistic, you're smart, or you can't be bipolar, you're too nice. As if I can't be smart, nice, funny, or any other good thing because I have mental illnesses. I mean, go ahead, combat my argument with that bumper sticker that says I'm not suffering from insanity, I'm enjoying every second of it. Or that beer can holder that says, my goal in life is to have a psychiatric disorder named after me. L listen, those may sound fetishistic, but if you really stop and think about it, the reason people in the mainstream buy these things is because they see it as a joke. They see us as a joke. They see our crippling psychological disorders as a joke. If the people who bought that stupid mental illness merch thought for a second that if people would take it literally, they would not have bought it. Because mental illness was and remains highly stigmatized. And you know what else? The worst part about mental illness, it's not the symptoms. It's how society treats you like a crazy person, like a drama queen. Like you're completely invalid because nothing in your head makes sense. Or you're lazy, you're weird, you need to change yourself to fit into society's tight mold. And you know what I have to say to that? So what if I'm crazy all the best people are? I wouldn't say I'm in a great place now, but I'm in a much better place than I was when I was always worried about how people perceived me because of my il mental illness, you know, avoiding relationships because I was afraid it would come up and other shit. Well, that wasn't my only reason for avoiding relationships, but whatever, anyway. Basically what I'm saying is, the Mad Hatter mindset helped me personally, and I know I can't be the only one. Because I really feel like it's an anthem for the weirdos who can't change who they are and don't particularly want to. I mean, if I could go back to the person I was before the trauma, well, that person was less miserable, but they weren't very nice or understanding. That person didn't go through the struggles I did and come out stronger. I just, I don't feel like that person was as good as the person I am today, you know? And at the end of the day, not everyone will feel the same way listening to Mad Hatter, and if the song makes you feel bad, you don't have to listen to it. But for the love of everything, please don't act like Melanie is a subhuman wretch who is trying to glamorize mental illness when we all know that damn well that was not her intention. That's it. Please rate, subscribe, and blessed be motherfuckers. Face reveal is Saturday the 13th. Hope to see you there.